All right. Hello and welcome. Okay, thank you. And you think we're good to go? All right, I'm hoping we're good to go. All right, welcome. Welcome all to our very first YouTube dialogue through the Bagwell College of Education at Kennesaw State University. I know that we have some faculty and students joining us today from the BCOE and perhaps a few other faculty and students from around KSU, so welcome. Um, in honor of Hispanic and Latino History Month, we really wanted to think about how language and culture influence students' experiences in B12 classrooms. And so what we decided to do as a standing committee for diversity was to ask people, ask some faculty around the Bagwell College of Education whose first language is Spanish, as well as a student in the Bagwell College of Education whose first language is also Spanish, to talk to us about their own personal experiences and in some cases, if possible, um, any of the larger trends that they know about in the US. Really though, the purpose of this dialogue is for us as faculty, and I'm so glad collaboratively with students, to demonstrate the importance of dialogue. So one thing that became very clear to us in the Standing Committee for Diversity was that we kept having this circular conversation about how to talk about Latinos, Latinx, Latinas, Latino, Latina with the at symbol or the myriad other ways that um, the culture of Latinos can be represented um, in written text as well as in verbal communication. And none of us in the room at the Standing Committee for Diversity meetings, at these two meetings when we had these conversations, were first, um, first language Spanish speakers. And so we thought, in the interest of both really trying to figure out a few different perspectives on this question, there's not really a right or wrong, clearly, but a few different perspectives on the question about how to refer to Latinx communities, um, that we would ask folks to kind of have that dialogue in a way that we could see. We are also really committed in the Standing Committee for Diversity to model dialogue and discourse. We know that this is what really creates participatory and um, productive citizenship engagement. So at this time, I would like to invite our panelists to please introduce themselves. And um, if at any point you have questions about what the panelists are saying, please feel free to type your questions into the chat box. We have Dr. Ann Bennett from secondary and middle grades here helping us with the technicalities of all this. So please be patient as we try our first time on this platform. Um, at this time, uh, perhaps we could start with Yvonne, introducing yourself and telling us a bit about your relationship to this topic. Hola a todas y a todos. Hi, my name is um, Ivan Jorrin. I'm professor of educational research in the Bagwell College of Education, of course, secondary and middle grades. And I'm originally from uh, Spain. So I was living for a couple of years in Chicago. And then four years ago, almost five years ago, I moved here to Georgia and started working for Kennesaw State University. Gillian, you are mute. Thank you so much. And that was exactly who I just asked. Paola, can you introduce yourself, please?
I think now it's working. <laughs> Uh, my name is Paula Guerra. I'm an associate professor of mathematics education in the elementary and early childhood education department. I am from Uruguay. I was a math teacher there. Um, I came to the States uh, first to Arizona, um, where I went to grad school for six years. And I was really relieved to be placed in Arizona because I thought there I was going to find a lot of people to actually speak Spanish with me. It didn't really work out that way, but uh, I did meet a lot of other Latinos and a uh, very different reality than the one that I was living being a graduate student. Uh, graduate student. Um, but yeah, that, that's a little bit about myself. Thanks so much, Paula. And San Juana, please introduce yourself. Hi everyone, uh, my name is San Juana Rodriguez. And um, just to tell you a little bit about uh, my life and my story, I, um, my family moved to um, the US when I was eight years old. And so um, I was born in Mexico and um, started school there, um, first and second grade, and then moved to the US. My father had been living here in the US and um, was um, had been had gone back and forth to and from Mexico as an undocumented worker, and then under the Reagan administration, was able to adjust his status here in the U.S. And so we um, uh, joined him here in the U.S. I was eight years old and came to um, a new country. Uh, didn't speak the language. Um, you know, to a new. Um, town here in Georgia, in Dalton, Georgia, of all places, the carpet capital of the world, uh, drew my father here for work. And so lots of people um, in similar ways that in other places, lots of people from the town where I lived in in Mexico moved here. And um, and so I started school and um, went to school, learned English through the sink or swim method. Um, I was one of maybe seven students in my in my entire school who who spoke Spanish at the time. And so we were bused to another school where we went to a class to learn English. And so that's kind of my journey of how I learned to speak um, English. And then uh, went through the through the through the um, school system here and um, of course decided to be a teacher and I've taught in Georgia. And um, now I'm an assistant professor in um, elementary and early childhood. And my focus area is um, literacy. Thanks so much, San Juana. And Alexa, please introduce yourself by telling us what year you are and what connects you to this conversation. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name I'm a political science major, a Spanish minor, and my parents actually moved here from Mexico City, and I uh, we ended up here moving to Georgia when I was one professor of Spanish grow up learning and speaking both English and Spanish, uh, asking my mom questions, um, bringing her books in Spanish, and helping me read, start learning to learn, learn both languages. So I always ban to be able to learn about Mexican culture and the profession, um, profession of teaching the language as well. Thank you so much. Thanks to all the panelists for being here and for sharing your experiences and wisdom with us. We really appreciate it. Um, in the article that I sent out by Kobas and Fagan from 2008, um, about language oppression and resistance, there were some strategies that the authors talked about in terms of strategies to control both the Spanish language and in some ways even the Latinos or Hispanics who speak the Spanish language. And um, 
So there were a few of those strategies listed in the article. And I was wondering if I could ask you all if any of those um, strategies or uh, spoke to you in particular in your ability to resist um, those strategies. One of the things just for those faculty and students who are watching um, that I wanna make clear is that the article that I shared with folks is about both the oppression and the resistance of middle-class Latinos in the United States. And, I, and that's important because as, we're, as we are expanding our knowledge and understanding of diverse populations, it's really crucial that we think about both how uh, communities are marginalized but also how they resist that marginalization. That's a huge part of the story. Um, so at this point, I can really open the panel up. And if anyone wants to speak freely on that, feel free to. Otherwise, I, I can ask some more specific questions. OK. <clears throat> Do you want me to jump in? <laughs> OK. Um, I have many notes and comments in the article you shared with us. Actually, it was new to me. And I relate to some of the aspects mentioned there. But uh, before that, and to put everybody in context, if it's OK, I would like to share with you all a um, short uh, narrative vignette I put together um, as a result of my experience when I um, first came to Keneso. And this happened during the orientation week. Let me share it with you. It says, it's, the, the title is Reconsidering Myself. I'm blue, I'm red, I'm also yellow, purple and pink, I'm black. I'm a Spaniard born and raised near the Basque country. My parents always told me that I was white. In my country, Spain, I'm white. However, it seems that I'm not white anymore. As, as, as soon as I put my feet on campus, and I started filling out the multiple forms I was asked uh, to complete during orientation week, I realized that I was wrong. Should I check the box that reads Latino? The description in the form reads, check Latino if you are of Latin American origin or ancestry, including Brazil. Wait, wait a minute. The word Latino comes from the Spanish word Latinoamericano, Latin American, which is commonly used to refer to the brotherhood among people living in Spanish-speaking countries, both in the Americas and Europe. Latino comes from Latin, the language used in countries like Italy, Greece, Spain, in the Roman Empire. In Spain, we call ourselves Latinos, like Italians and Greeks do because we share the Latin language culture. So just because I was not born in the Americas, I cannot call myself Latino? Really? Well, maybe it would be better if I check the box that says Caucasian. I was born in Europe in the end. Am I white in this context here at KSU? Has this context changed who I am and the way I see myself? Do contexts? change who you are? Well, maybe I should check the box that says others. But what does that even mean, others? I'm blue, I'm red, I'm also yellow, purple and pink, I'm black. If these fools knew that I'm the richest man in the world living like this, living like a leaf, living out of the embrace of my people and their cultures, they have forgotten that a man is just a man, that your hands are my flag, and that my only border is a song. That was my experience the very first week, as soon as I arrived. Thank you so much, Ivan, for sharing that vignette with us and for sharing your experiences the first week you arrived. Really appreciate it. I would like to sort of respond to that because I had a similar experience coming to the States. I think 
uh, as a uh, new Hawaiian thinking about Latinos, I had the same definition of a, what a Latino is that Ivan just described. So if you speak a language that is, you know, derived from Latin, then you're Latino. So if you speak uh, Portuguese and you're from Portugal or Brazil, or you speak Spanish or Italian, then you are Latino. Um, but I also thought I was white because I had heard my whole life that I was white. And uh, that is, uh, it, back when I go to Uruguay, that is what I am, I am white. So not only you have to reconsider who, who is Latino and who isn't then, but also then who's white and who's not white. Um, I, I'm still uh, divided about those. Again, I, I don't have to fill up that many forms I did back in the day when I was in Arizona, uh, being a graduate student, especially all those forms for the international student office. But still, every time there's a form to be filled, it's again, okay. Uh, I think they have a, the specific one for me that it's white, but of South American descent, something like that. It's very specific. Um, and it's very interesting, the need of having so many specific labels, so we perhaps don't fall into that um, top category. Thank you, Paola. And truthfully, I was hoping that you would follow up because I remember when, um, when I first met you, your first year, you shared that experience with me. Um, and so I'm glad that you were able to share how it overlaps with Yvonne's experience, especially one of you coming from South America and one of you coming from Europe. I think that's really fascinating that that linguistic, that linguistic tie created a similar experience for both of you on coming to the United States. Um, San Juana or Alexa, please join. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about my own identity and how um, I was think and how it has shifted and what I call myself has has really shifted. And um, I'll start with um, what I used to call myself. <laughs> um, and and I, um, I the farthest I can think of and to think about like what do I do I, what do I identify as is. Of course, I'm a Mexican woman, but but uh, like Ivan and Paula said, you have to identify yourself on forms, right? And so then you have to choose something else. You can't choose Mexican. And so, um, and so I thought about when when did I first think when? So I was thinking about when did I first start considering this or thinking about this, and. And it really, for me, it goes it goes back to um, when I began to dabble in research as an undergraduate student. So I was an undergraduate student at Mercer University in Macon, Georgia, <laughs> um, a very conservative space. Um, but I had the opportunity to be a, Mag a McNair scholar. And so McNair scholars are, uh, if you don't know about that program, it's a program that takes um, typically first generation um, college students uh, first in their family, of course, to go to college. And you in the summers, um, I would go to the in, to Knoxville University of Tennessee, and I was paired with a faculty member as an undergraduate student to engage in research. And so um, she asked me, "So, what do you identify yourself as?" This was a white woman, but uh, but because she wanted to know my interests, and she knew I had an interest in um, topics related to the Latino community, then then I said, well, I'm interested in topics related to um, Hispanic people. That was what I said, like me, right? I'm Hispanic. That's what I choose on the forms. And so, um, so she challenged me to think about that term. And that was really when I first started to think about, well, this is a term that I've adopted because someone else says I have to choose that, right? And so as I learned a little bit about the history of it, and how it came to be placed on um, census forms. Um, then I chose not to use that term. And, and so um, I know that it's still widely used. And so I shifted to use the word Latino, right? So I was a Latina woman then, um, even though when, when I thought of myself, I'm, I'm a Mexican woman. So I'm a Latina now, right? And so, um, but as I have kind of followed what I have done since then, um, I taught in a 
a school that was predominantly Latino, right? All of my students were Latino. I was a Latina teacher. So I adopted that that um, term. Um, then I looked back. So when did I shift to using um, that term Latinx, right? Or Latinx. And so um, it was about two years ago when I first learned about it. And so I learned a little bit about um, about the term because I was writing a, an article for a journal and I used the term Latin, Latina, Latino with um, the arroba. <laughs> the, and so, and so the, the journal editor um, came back, to, this was a co-authored piece to my colleague and I and said, um, well, can you say, can you talk about why you chose to use this term as opposed to Latinx or Latinx? And so, we began to have conversations about it and thought, well, he's right, maybe we should. And so looking at why we would choose to use that term, and I know there's a lot of debate about it. So, um, but we, we um, based on our, our research then and what our beliefs were, we chose to use the term because we felt it was more of an uh, inclusive term. And so uh, I have been using the term since then. And so, but I do understand that there is some debate about the use of the term um, and whether or not you should still use Latina Latino, which I feel is not as gender neutral. And, and in my opinion, the Latinx or Latinx is a more inclusive term. So anyway, that's a long um, history, but that's the, that's the term I use now in, in, in my own research. But I'm still a Mexican woman, <laughs> even though I have to use Latinx. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, San Juan. I really appreciate the nuances that you brought up. Please, Paula. I thought that it was really interesting how at the end she just finished by saying, but I'm still a Mexican woman because, yes, in the end, that's what I am too. I am a little wine. The way that I speak Spanish is very really different than the way that San Juan speaks Spanish. We understand each other perfectly, and, and Ivan, same thing with Ivan. Um, right now in Uruguay, they are having the conversation about more inclusive language. Instead of using an X, they're thinking of using an E. Uh, and there's a lot of resistance, and uh, I, I'm not, I'm familiar with the resistance, but I'm not familiar with the law and, and what is that they want to change and how they want to change and who's supposed to do what, I'm assuming schools. Uh, but but yes, uh, I I just want to highlight that I'm still a Mexican woman. I'm definitely still a white woman. <laughs> I want to echo. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay, I want to echo San Juana. Um, same thing for me. I consider myself well. I consider myself a Mexican American woman. I've also been looking more into the idea of and movement of the Chicano movement. Um, growing up, I mostly considered myself Hispanic, I guess because that was the term that I knew. Um, but over the years, I, I shifted to referring to myself as Latina. Um, as I've been researching more and being involved in political movements and social justice work, I've seen the new the trend of the word Latinx from scholars and activists and people who are committed to social justice work. So over the last year, I have attempted to shift to considering myself Latinx because I think that though my I I am um, on the gender binary as a woman, I think that it's important to be gender inclusive and have inclusive language and so just because this is a term um latino or latina is a term that we've used for years uh does not mean that we cannot you know make the attempt to be at the forefront of that shift towards more inclusive language yeah it's um it's fascinating the way um, my own experience relate to most of what you have shared. And my, in, in my case, I never 
reflected that much about my identity until I came here, not even when I was working in, in Chicago. Uh, I didn't have to, actually. But since I arrived here, I started talking about this. Actually, I remember a really interesting conversation with Paula um, four or five years ago about this. Um, I always remember when I was teaching in Spain, I had to be very, very careful to be uh, regarding the gender uh, I was using in my discourse, especially when uh, teaching in a college of education in which probably 85% of my students were uh, women. So in Spanish, you have to be very careful because the language is not uh, gender neutral. I mean, you have to be very active in using the feminine version of us, for instance, nosotras. Um, and, and most of the times we use, we prefer using the generic terms instead of um, gender related terms. And also when writing um, our research, we have to be very, very careful with that. So before coming here, um, I was always happy when I was writing in English because I didn't have to do that because I thought English language was pretty neutral. <laughs> and I've been learning since then that it's not that neutral and that sometimes you have to make your uh, political position clear in your writing. And I believe terms like Latindex are more related to showing and sharing your political uh, positioning than defining yourself in that way. In my case, I, I'm a guy from Spain. I mean, that's how I define myself. But if I have to choose a term when writing something on these issues, I would use Latindex, for instance. I wonder if the reason why, when you were in Chicago, you were a student there, correct? Yes. Um, mm, I was there twice. The very first time I was a student. The second okay. time was a visiting scholar. Uh, so teacher. those times, you, you did not really feel um, like you had to. And I wonder if, because I felt like when I was a graduate student, I was very shelter from what was happening outside of the school. So you are in this environment that's really uh, diverse. Um, and, and also, I mean, you said I'm a guy from Spain. You are a guy. I wonder if that also gives you a little bit of the privilege of not having to ride when you are off the plane, uh, start wondering. Because I remember for me, it was like almost immediate. I'm like now, wow, like, yes, who, who am I? <laughs> um, yeah. and. Um, I was just thinking that the first time that I heard more inclusive language being used was about 10 years ago when the man who's a president in my country now, he was running for president for the first time. And in his speeches, he would be all the time like todos y todas, nosotros y nosotros, all the time it was double. And I thought, wow, that must be exhausting. Like the whole time you have to do it that way. And I remember a lot of people thinking that it was just funny, but at the same time, it felt very warm. Like I felt like he was really talking to all of us. So it was, there was never a discussion about it, but it was that feeling of exhaustion, but also warmth, I think. Yeah, Paula, for instance, in, in you know that there is this institution that it's called the Real Academia de la Lengua Española. It's like the committee in charge of uh, protecting the Spanish language. And they are totally against using this. And I don't agree with them. I think they are wrong because I believe language needs to evolve. But the thing is that there are different ways. I think it's sometimes it's too much using both the feminine and the masculine in every single sentence. I think it's hard for who is speaking and also for the listener. However, um, I just wanted to give you an example. When I was teaching in Spain, I always use the uh, feminine term referring to me, myself, since I'm a person and person is a feminine term in Spanish. So I was talking and I was saying, nosotras pensamos, like we think in feminine. And you know, all my students were laughing at me. And I had to make explicit that I was using that term because of them, because they were 85% women in my, in my courses. 
So it was a respectful way of using language based on uh, the people in the room. Uh, so sometimes we also need to overuse these kind of uh, terms so people get used to them and start thinking about it, I believe. I really appreciate that point and all of the points that you've made. One thing that I would like to really just underscore that several of you have mentioned is that re responsivity to context. And so even the what both Paula and Yvonne, you have both shared over the last two comments, that um, dual truth, that simultaneous truth of language being so important and, um, and exhausting sometimes to kind of get it right um, or to attempt to get it right. But at the same time, the warmth that comes along with that effort um, is something that as educators, I think we should all really, really reflect on. Um, I think that one thing I suggest to my students, and I'd be curious to hear um, if you all have other ideas, but the importance of context in my estimation cannot be overstated. And so um, for pre-service teachers and even for colleagues, I think that it's um, pretty perhaps maybe typical to get concerned and nervous about how to call different groups because you don't wanna get it wrong. And I think that's a serious thing to consider. But I also think that having a disposition of understanding that you want for people who are that identity, whatever that identity is, to be able to claim their identity and then you follow what they are saying is kind of a great way to um, to take that stress off of yourself, to be very explicit with your students to say, I have an identity, you know, probably even sharing your identity. Um, and I really want to know how you all identify and what, what kind of language makes you feel respected um, and realizing that those terms may change for the same student over the course of a year or a week or a day, or they may s remain static, but just kind of recognizing that we as the educator are, are to adopt what students say for themselves. I think is a great way to kind of um, bring all of those voices into the classroom. Um, so I'm wondering if you all have had any of the experiences, some of which they highlight in, in the article about being silenced, being um, believed to be not credible because of your accent, um, your accent, as as though people, not everybody has an accent, um, or, you know, with the English language only, English only kind of um, protocols. I'm wondering if you could share, please, how that's affected you, your children, and or how it might be affecting students in schools today. I will go first because mine oh, okay. is, uh, oh, sorry, Sanjuana. Um, it's minor, but it keeps happening almost every day. Uh, I get people correcting me how I say my name and my country's name all the time. And I think that is a way of controlling language too. It's like, where are you from? I'm from Uruguay. And then they're like, from Hawaii? No, 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 Uruguay in South America. Oh, Uruguay. <laughs> I think I know how my country is, uh, the name of my country, but that happens all the time. And I understand not being able to sometimes to pronounce some of our names, but, uh, but there's no need of correcting me, I think. Once I told you who I am and where I'm from, you don't need to revoice me to tell me this is the right way. I would have understood if you have said it the right way. So that's my experience. I'll follow up on that, Paula, because 
what I've been really thinking about names. Um, and so one of the one of the things that I that I did with my pre-service teachers this semester, which was new, something new that I've done, just because I've been thinking about the importance of correctly pronouncing students' names and how names are students' identities and how often I have seen in my own experience how students' names get changed, professors' names get changed. And so I did, the first day of class, I had the students think about their own name stories. And then we read an article um, called um, La Historia de Mi Nombre, Name Stories. It was about a teacher who really took time to learn about their students and um, their stories tied to their names and the importance of, um, of why it's important to say students' names correctly. And so anyway, I just wanted to follow up um, on what you said about that people don't need to correct you on your own name and the, the country of your uh, and your the name of your country. Um, but um, Jillian, I'm, I'm going to go back to your question if that's OK. Um, so I want to talk when I read the article, I sorry, you can hear my son. He just got home. Um, um, you can. I'm sorry. Um, one of the things that I thought about was that silencing piece and the language control. And as a as a um, first year teacher in the state of Georgia, that's one of the um, one of the things that came to mind. And that is that um, as a Spanish speaking teacher who taught 100 percent of Spanish speaking students in my class, I was not allowed to speak to them in Spanish. Now, this was never voiced to me. No one ever said, you can't speak to them in Spanish. And so um, as I, when I began my doctoral program, I started to think about why did I think that? And I began to analyze some of the policies in, in Georgia and, um, and how the message that is really sent to teachers, even for me as a teacher who spoke Spanish, who could support my students in, in their language, when I did it, I felt like I would get in trouble for doing that. And so uh, the language policy in the state of Georgia currently, even now, states that you can own to, that the goal is for students to understand and successful it, to understand and function successfully in our American culture. And to accomplish these goals, it may be necessary to provide some support in their native language at times. And so if you think about that's the language policy for ESOL students. And so um, that's still the message that many teachers receive is that they can only provide that support to students if that if the goal is to help those students understand and function successfully in our American culture. And so um, I just thought about the language control and how I was silenced and reminded me of, of when I was a teacher and how I didn't allow myself to speak um, Spanish to my students who were who spoke who all spoke Spanish and and what a disservice I was doing to them for that and it also made me think of dual language programs that are now very becoming very popular in um, the state of Georgia so if you know a little bit about that it's um, Im important to note um, and that the the growth and popularity of those programs is mainly because it does benefit monolingual english speaking students first and so we have to think about um, that also and how the power that that language has even in schools and how um, that silencing and the language control and denigrating of certain languages is still happening i mean we all know it does but it it um it continues um, to be perpetuated through policies that privi privilege English and benefit monolingual English speakers. So, San Juana, I have a, an example of that that broke my heart. Um, I'm okay with people trying to silence me. I mean, I'm a grown up and I know how to defend myself, but. Um, Every year we have um, kids, Latino kids, children coming from different, uh, well, from a particular uh, school to the College of Education. They are working in a project that San Juana knows 
better than I do, that it's called Cuentos de Mi Vida. So these uh, Latino children, they are working in, you know, sharing their stories, their life stories, both in Spanish and English, using a little technology, whatever. So every year I go to the presentations of their projects. And um, when I start talking to them, when I approach them, I always ask them, do you prefer if we talk to each other in Spanish or in English? Do you know their answer? English. And I said, why? <laughs> and they always tell me, some of them tell me, I don't want to be different. And then I remember one of them, um, he asked me, so do you work here? And I say, yes. And he told me, so why do you work here if you speak Spanish? I mean, there is that cultural issue. They don't have actually a lot of role models. Um, they believe if they keep on speaking Spanish, they are, gonna ha they are not going to have a career or, or something like that. But, but that, those are the kind of things that really break my heart. I mean, because those are our future. <laughs> when I worked with uh, middle schoolers uh, in Arizona, and they were Latinas, um, I also, when I started, I asked them what language they wanted to do the interviews. And we had like several group interviews. And they all said that they wanted to do it in English too. Um, but then uh, by the middle of the, of, of the whole experience and process, I had an interview with their parents. So the parents were there and they were there too. And without any having to give any explanation, we all switched to Spanish. So from then on, we always spoke Spanish after we had that group interview with the parents. So that was really interesting for me. I think, um, I didn't ask, but I think that she they wanted to be uh, like professional and formal and show that they you know, they spoke English much better than I do. Uh, but then they felt very, very comfortable with Spanish because it was their home language. Thank Can you. I uh, follow up uh, on it, Julian? I, uh, you know, this just brought back a conversation I had just this past um, Friday. I, I've seen outside in the BCOE on the third floor, and you may have seen them also. There's these two um, women that sit there. They're in the math, they're in the math, secondary math program. Both were former engineers. Um, and so um, both mentioned Brian Lawler was their advisor or something. And so, but I was talking to them, and because I see them working there all the time. So I stopped and talked to them and wanted to know what program are you in? Because you study so much all the time. You're sitting here all the time. And so they began to tell me about a little bit about their stories. One was an engineer. One was a software designer, I think. Um, and now they're both becoming mathematics um, educators at, at the secondary level. Um, and so they were sharing a little bit about their journey with them. And, some, and one of them said to me, the only bad thing about this is that I have, that, that I have an accent and I have to teach students and I have an accent. And so I looked at her and I said, you should not, you should never think an accent is a bad thing, right? And that is, that is proof that you've learned a new language. That is a good thing and you should be really proud of it. But if, even our pre-service teachers that we're preparing, you know, see this language and see um, having an accent as a negative, as a negative thing. And so, uh, you know, I think, um, we have to think about the power of language and even how we um, present this in, in our own courses and how we can shift people's beliefs about, you know, what a great thing it is for someone to be bilingual and to have acquired um, a second language or multiple languages. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks so much for bringing that up. Also, San Juana. Actually, um, Natasha Thornton shared a, a term that was new to me recently with me um, last week or the week before, really highlighting, I think, the point that one of the points that you were just making, San Juana, about, um, about seeing multilingualism as an asset 
um, first and foremost. And so instead of English learners, um, Natasha told me we can refer to this group of students as emergent multilinguals or emergent bilinguals. And we can think about as the, you know, as we've all been talking about the power of language, what that shift does. I'll just share briefly that in graduate school, I um, did some research with a few youth in some refugee communities in Clarkston. And I was able to talk a lot with a colleague of mine, uh, Teresa Alviar, who was also in graduate school with me at the same time years ago, over a decade ago. Um, and she was doing at that time some research on uh, on students at elite international schools. And so what we realized was that much like several of our panelists have been talking about, these elite private international schools that of course cost a lot of money, um, really heavily invest in teaching students oftentimes whose first language is English, different languages. Um, and at the same time, I was working in Clarkston, just east of Decatur, working with students who knew at them, I didn't meet a student who knew less than three languages, certainly. Most of them were more than that. But realizing um, what Scholar Castles calls migration from above and migration from below, meaning those folks who um, are traveling across borders with lots of financial uh, capital and those who are not really affects the way their language is or is not valued. So one thing I think that we can do in, in our classrooms and that we must do in our classrooms is exactly what all the panelists have already been saying, but to value folks' languages and to take a second seat to hearing what they, they know. For all of us um, you know, here who are monolingual, um, I think, the the idea of being at least bilingual or multilingual could blow your mind more than you may even know that it can. And I'll just say that many years ago, I spoke better Spanish than I do today. But one thing that I know about learning a second language is that the concepts are not always transferable. So of course, when you're learning a new language, you're learning not only how to say the same things that you know in a different language, you're also learning new ways, new concepts, new ideas and ways to think about. So to think of multilingualism as anything other than an asset is really, is really doing a disservice to our youth and to our own classrooms as being welcoming places, you know, for all students to really thrive. So I see uh, um, actually that we are almost near the end. Um, I do just want to say two things because I see that there were at least two questions on the YouTube, you, YouTube chat. For the first question, I'm going to send a link. So one of the questions that I see is, what is that um, critique against Latinx? In the interest of time, I'll send a link, uh, something that I read in preparation for this conversation. Um, and I don't assume or presume or assert that it is the final word on this issue, um, but, I, but it will definitely shed some insight into what the critique is of Latinx. And the other question is something that I would really like to just open to the panel and maybe you could, um, each way in uh, about this if you have an idea or two and that will be a great way to wrap it up um so this person asks as the adoptive parent of three young latinas i am wondering how to help them learn to identify themselves within the u.s and global context any suggestions so i i'm just posing that to you i see alexa already took her thing off so i'll just let Alexa take it away. <laughs> so um, my dad, he, like I said, my parents came to the United States from Mexico City. And growing up, my dad always only spoke to my brother and I in English. 
And my mother, as a professor of Spanish, she was intent on me listening to Spanish all of the time, reading in Spanish and getting as immersed as possible in the Spanish language and Mexican culture. And so it was kind of like one side, my mom wanted me to be proud and part of my culture, while on the other side, my dad sort of was incredibly assimilated into um, American culture and kind of had this idea that he wanted to be seen as American. And to do that, he had to reject his Mexican culture, his language, even to the point where he didn't want to pass on the language to, um, to me and my brother, perhaps because he wanted us to be assimilated as well. But I found that my mom um, giving so much importance to me on learning Spanish and Mexican culture, learn about my, my culture and language so that I could form my own identity. And through that, I did form an identity, but only because I was educated on my culture and pushed to see that it's not something negative, but something to be proud about. And it's, and it's something to be proud about to, to know two languages. So I think that, especially if, you know, as someone being an adoptive parent of Latinas, I think that it would be important to share with them how important, how they, they should be proud of, you know, where they come from, proud to learn their language, giving them educational books about their country of origin, giving them a push to say, you know, learning Spanish is a good, maybe you should try to start learning some Spanish or read some books in Spanish. So giving them that option to veer or get into their uh, culture is a good way for the place to start today. Thank you, thank you. Great suggestions. I want to say something too from the point of view also of a mom, new mom. Um, I think that there's nothing that I want more than my daughter to feel that she's from Uruguay too. So it's it's in, in the small things like uh, like the foods that we eat, and, and and watching soccer together and in in the big things like just what Alexa shared like sharing books with her when she can learn about the the struggles of the country the successes of the country the things that we as people the Uruguayan people have gone through and where we are now um, the the recent history the you know the history history so I it is my plan to share all that with her and um, to make her feel that even though she was born here, she was also born there. Um, and I think that because I am a little bit in competition with the father who is not from Uruguay and it's not from the state, then I, I think um, maybe I'm going a little bit overboard with it, but um, I'm, that it's, it is really important for me that she feels that it's not that she just can speak Spanish, but that she is from the wife so. Thank you for sharing that, Paula. I just wanna check in and see if San Juana and Yvonne have either something to suggest for that person or just some closing um, ideas and remarks. One thing while you're thinking um, that I'll say is several years ago, I had an opportunity to go uh, to two different schools, actually. Um, and it was two different years also. But one was a Japanese school that happens on Saturdays. And at that time, it was being held in um, Lindley Sixth Grade Academy. And so one of my students from KSU who was from Japan brought me to the Saturday school um, just to show you know show me what they do there, um, and and the other event that I went to 
was similar, but it was on Buford Highway a few years prior, and it was a Chinese Saturday school. And so I offer those as examples, um, really just of those examples of a Japanese school and a Chinese school of which I know, you know, that those exist in the metro area. But one thing that really impressed me at those schools was that there were several Chinese um, kids there who had Chinese born parents. There were some Chinese kids there who had Chinese American parents and there were both times that I went, both Chinese and then at the other school, Japanese um, kids who had white adoptive parents. And I just really, I saw that as a, a great thing for those parents to do for exactly the reasons that you have both shared. In my case, um, I don't have children, so I don't have that experience, but I have uh, nephews and nieces and I be I totally echo what Paula, Gillian, and Alexa just mentioned. Um, I think providing them with as many opportunities as possible to experience the culture of their um, countries of origin, I think it's going to be great. But not only for them, for everybody. I mean, I have a little niece right now. She is in Spain, and she was born in Spain. But um, my mom talks to her in English because she wants her to experience the culture of other countries. And, and it's amazing how a two-year-old um, understands that, you know, it's not only about the language, but the culture. I mean, she knows that I live here far away from her place, even though she's two. And she already understands that there are other places that we celebrate Halloween here. They don't celebrate it there. You know, those kind of small things are, I believe, very important to enrich your life in general. So that's, that's something I will do. And Jillian, I'll just say one small thing. Um, I think language is so tied to identity, right? If language is 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 so is intricately woven in through into who you are as a person and so any opportunity like Yvonne said to have them experience um, their culture their language because that really shapes you know the who you become and and providing that um, those experiences I think um, would be very valuable thank you I can really, I cannot thank you enough to each of our four panelists for sharing your experiences with us, your insights, um, and for really making this first YouTube dialogue such a success. I would like to ask those folks who are watching to please feel free to email me any questions, follow-up questions that you have, things that I might be able to answer or could help find answers to. Um, if you have questions about anything that we've talked about this evening, I do believe and hope that uh, we've gotten the technical um, elements right so that we've been recording this and that can be posted. And um, we look forward to continuing the conversation. So many thanks again to the panelists and I look forward to more conversation. Thank you. <laughs>